They are large, they are muscly and the pride and joy of their breeders. We are squeezing as much as we can out of our livestock. The world is getting hungrier and hungrier for more meat and milk, but by pushing animals to their limits, we are doing the same to our planet. But if we can turn animals into food production machines, couldn't we also breed them to be more environmentally friendly? Sheep that emit less methane, salmon that need less food, or pigs that excrete fewer toxins? There's, there's hardly any ecological niche where genetics or genomics um, can't come up with a solution. Scientists are working on designing more sustainable animals by selective breeding or even by artificially changing their genetic code. Are these great ways to make food production more sustainable or crazy interventions into nature? Let's check out how scientists are working to design the perfect animal. And just a quick trigger warning. This video contains some images showing animal cruelty. Even before humans settled, we've been modifying plants and animals, meaning for more than 10,000 years to an astonishing extent. We've optimized maize and rice harvests and engineered zucchinis to be non-toxic, sheep to be stronger and wolves to be more obedient. We've been doing this very successfully. This is Professor John Dupre. He deals with ethical aspects of animal welfare and animal breeding. Um, I mean, you know, if you, if you compare the growth rates and the sizes of animals, just over the last few decades, I mean, there's been enormous increases in productivity. The hunger for more and cheaper meat and milk has led to chicken that appear fully grown at 20 days old, double muscled cattle and pigs born with four more ribs than usual. There's not much more room probably in um, increasing um, yields. In 1961, a single cow in the US produced nine liters of milk per day. Today's cows produce an average of 28 liters. That means that through breeding, the carbon footprint of one glass of milk is a third of what it was many decades ago. Cows still burp and fart greenhouse gases, but for it, they also produce much more milk. But as the world is drinking more and more milk overall, these savings in emissions are dwindling. Not to mention, this way of producing food has a brutal flip side. Animals living in horrific conditions or suffering as they grow faster or bigger than their body can actually support. And one factor is driving this to ever greater extremes. Meats. The best meat. The best cut of meat you can get. Red meat. Meat consumption around the world is exploding. While the global population has roughly tripled in the past 60 years, meat production has increased fivefold, with richer countries eating most of it. Livestock farming requires enormous quantities of water and agricultural land for animal feed and contributes to more than 14% of all man-made greenhouse gas emissions. No matter how productive our animals are, the way we produce food is horrible for the planet. But if we can breed cows to produce more milk and chickens to grow faster, could you also breed them to burp less methane or excrete fewer chemicals? Some scientists and companies are trying to do exactly that, either by good old selective breeding or by artificially changing the animal's genes. For example, there are people working on enabling cows to cope with higher temperatures as the planet is heating up. Others are trying to make animals resistant to severe diseases, arguing this would also improve animal welfare. There are lots of projects like this underway, but one achieved special notoriety. Meet the Enviropig. In the 2000s, a Canadian research project funded by the pork industry implanted genes from mice as well as the bacterium E. coli into a pig. The effect? The animals digested significantly more phosphorus than usual, so their manure contained up to 60% less phosphorus. Why did they do this? Well, the scientists wanted to address a fundamental agricultural problem these cuties cause. Overfertilization. Excrement from pigs full of phosphorus is usually put on fields as fertilizer as it is an important nutrient for blossoming and fruiting plants. But only half of the phosphorus applied to the fields worldwide can be absorbed by the plants. The result? The nutrient turns into poison in soils and water and depletes oxygen levels, killing loads of fish and other marine life. 
But to say the least, not everybody thought the Enviopic was a great idea. Pork farmers were concerned that skeptical consumers would stop eating pork, and environmental groups said tampering with pig's DNA was unnecessary as other solutions to reduce phosphorus and manure were already available. We saw it as, as kind of continuous with a very long history of um, co constructing, creating animals for our needs, which obviously for some people is, is um, you know, intrinsically morally unacceptable. Enviropig never made it beyond research stage. With no interest from the industry, as well as lots of question marks concerning regulation, investors withdrew in 2012. But that doesn't mean others stopped trying to genetically optimize animals. The Atlantic Salmon Bread by Aquabounty is a safe, secure and sustainable alternative for anyone looking for fresh salmon that is good for them and good for the planet. The company Aquabounty promises their genetically modified salmon is more sustainable than traditionally produced salmon. They introduce genes from other wild fish to create what they call aqua-advantaged salmon. These super salmon are supposed to grow twice as fast as usual salmon and require up to 25% less feed. And the more efficiently we can produce fish, the better for the planet, right? This is not about um, sustainability. This is not about producing um, better animals. This is about producing a genetically engineered product for the profit of the company. This is Dana Pearls, advocating against this practice at NGO Friends of the Earth. And we can't see the data. There's a lot of data that is protected as confidential business information. We asked the company for a statement and to share their scientific data, but didn't receive any answer until the making of this video. The US Food and Drug Administration approved the fish as safe to eat in 2015, but civil rights and environmental groups were not happy with that decision and sued. There is scientific evidence highlighting the risk that if genetically engineered salmon breed with wild salmon, that within a couple generations, wild salmon could go extinct. Recently, scientists found that some genetically modified ornamental fish, brand named Glowfish, had escaped in Brazil. Experts have warned of the disruptive potential for local biodiversity. And not only ecosystems are at risk. The potential benefits of artificial genetic engineering can come at a price undesirable mutations and side effects. Recently, the US Food and Drug Administration discovered that during genetic experiments with cows, genes from an antibiotic-resistant bacterium made it into their DNA. A report found that such errors in gene editing often go underreported or are overlooked. Considering all this, in 2020, a US court ruled the US Food and Drug Administration had failed to consider and study the environmental consequences of approving genetically engineered salmon. Nevertheless, one major retailer is starting to distribute the fish to restaurants in the US and Canada. But what about less invasive selective breeding? Meaning, animals with the desired features are crossbred with each other to boost or disable certain traits. Genes are not directly modified. This sheep has won an award, or put it another way, its creators were honored for their contribution to mitigating climate change. And where else could this sheep be bred than in New Zealand, where sheep outnumber humans six to one? Making the meat and wool industry more sustainable is key for the country's own net zero target. We basically discovered that we can we can breed for, for less methane. This is Dr. Suzanne Rowe. For years, she has looked at how sheep could burp out fewer climate damaging gases. We can change the, the bugs that are in the stomach that, that break down the feed and we can change the amount of methane that, that's emitted. Every generation of sheep bred here emits a little bit less methane than the previous one, an effect that accumulates over time. So our, our lowest emitting sheep and the highest emitting sheep are around 25 to 30 percent different. Dr. Rowe says that apart from burping and farting less methane, the sheep are as healthy and productive as their high emitting companions and even meet the criteria for organic farming. To selectively breed the low methane sheep, the scientists first had to find the less gassy ones. So they put the sheep into a special high-tech chamber and let them get as windy as they liked. 
It wasn't possible to select the animals in such a cheap and effective way before, but the sheep here are only used for research purposes and not sold. The institute is going across the country and measuring sheep for their methane levels, no matter the breed, so farms can select the more sustainable animals themselves. The so-called fat chamber could potentially also be applicable to other grazing animals like cattle. But let's talk about the sheep, um, excuse me, the elephant in the room. Just because we can engineer animals that are more environmentally friendly, should we? So if it's introduced, it should be contributing to important social goals such as sustainability and we should be improving not worsening the welfare of the animals that we're dealing with we need to hit the pause button we need to work with what we have which are tools for a truly sustainable food system and we need to not be falling into this snake oil and trap of genetic engineered engineering companies that are seeking profit Currently, the only genetically engineered animals approved for consumption are found in the US and Canada. But this might change. The EU is still far off such a step, but NGOs are looking skeptically at leaders seemingly becoming more open to such ideas. In the UK, the government is already thinking of proposing regulations to allow the commercial development of gene-edited livestock. It seems to me likely that this, this, these could be on some of our plates um, in the next few years, um, let's say within the next five years. Questions about unwanted or as yet undiscovered side effects in animals and environmental risks remain. Selective breeding could be a safer and more viable alternative but will take more effort and time to have an effect. The problems that come with milk and meat production won't be solved by simply changing the animals. There are many other ways to minimize the sector's footprint, whether by some organic farming, eating chicken rather than red meat, or, most effectively, eating less meat in general. So what do you think? Can you imagine eating a genetically modified fish, or a low-methane sheep, or none of them? Tell us in the comments, and follow us. We have a new story for you, every Friday.